Good morning or good evening, um, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Yara Shafani. I am joining you from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, thank you for joining us today for the latest Kumi Now online gathering as we celebrate and promote the role that women have um, played in peace building, both in Palestine and around the globe. Um, before we start, I'd like to remind you that this session is being broadcasted live on YouTube. If you do not wish to appear, please turn off your video feed. We would also love it if you could quickly share one of the links that are being shared in the chat so that others may join. We are now starting to invite people from the audience to tell us how you're applying Kumi now back in your community or otherwise advocating for Palestine. If you have an idea or a project that you'd like to share for up to five minutes in a future meeting, please email us at kumi at kuminow.com. Now it's time for our weekly activism survey. Mark, could you launch the poll? Just gonna give everyone a few moments to uh, fill out some of those survey questions. Okay. Well, um, with regards to the poll, you can find out more facts about women in leadership role at the UN Women website. I believe it's going to be posted in the chat box. Um, and for number two, um, just to share, it's actually the correct answer is 24.5%. Uh, and so that seems to be the answer most folks got. So that's great. Um, and it's, it's, it's a thank you all for, for participating in the poll. I think it does show, however, you know, the, the disparities in between women and men in leadership. And so thank you to the Kumi Now folks for um, part, uh, putting together that exercise. Um, we do hope that you'll find this session interesting and informative. I would like to start by having everyone you'll be seeing today introducing, introduce themselves. Uh, as I shared, my name is Yara Shafani. Uh, I'm the executive director of Canadian Friends of Sibyl, and I am based in Canada. Um, Andraus, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is uh, Andraus Jahshan, and I am from the Jerusalem Old City, and I'm an employee at Sibyl for the last three years. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you, Andraus. It's great to be with you. And Denise, welcome. Second, Denise, yeah, unmute you. It's always the same. And Denise Asad, I am a storyteller from Caesarea, the ruined village, living now in Haifa with my family. Thank you, Denise. It's great to be here with you. Aranda, welcome. I am Randa Signora. Uh, I am a Jerusalemite. I live in Jerusalem and I am the director of the Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling, uh, currently based in Ramallah. Wonderful. Thank you, Randa. It's great to be here with you today. Thank you. Uh, Andros, could you give us an update of what's going on in Palestine? I, yes, of course, I would love that. One second. So the updates on the ground is as follows. Israeli occupation forces detained today at least 20 Palestinians in various parts of occupied territories, including two women who were detained after Israeli police uh, crushed a cultural event featuring traditional Palestinian women products mark uh, marking International Women's Day held, uh, held in, a, in an East Jerusalem neighborhood. 
according to various sources in the Palestinian Prisoner Society, TPS. Palestinians recorded 2,003 new coronavirus cases in the last 24 hours, 22 deaths, and 1,909 recoveries, according to the daily update on the coronavirus by the Palestinian Ministry of Health. It said that 1,619 new cases were recorded in the West Bank, 17 deaths, and 1,196 recoveries. Hundreds of Palestinian citizens of Israel protested on Friday against police violence and their inaction over crime and the spread of firearms among gangs operating in Palestinian villages. Protests erupted in several towns and villages, including Umm al Fahin, Kfar uh, uh, Qara, and uh, Tamra, where a 22 year old Palestinian, Ahmed Hijazi, was killed during a police uh, shootout with masked gunmen in early uh, February. For those who know Father Maroon Tanus, the parish priest of Marjorie's in Elabun in Galilee, and a longtime friend of Sabine, who participated in many of its activities in the north, is suffering from serious health issues and in need of a liver transplant. Please keep him in your prayers. And, uh, that's, the, uh, and that's it for uh, today's um, updates on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambrose. So I've been following the protests in Um al um, So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I'd like to now turn things over to Denise Assad, our wonderful storyteller, who will be telling us a story that relates to today's issues. Welcome, uh, Denise. Thank you. And I am really, really very happy to join you week after week. A happy Women's Day for all the women in Palestine and all over the world. And my story today is uh, from um, the stories about uh, the King Arthur and his knights with the knights of the table, round table. Uh, king Arthur was a really very wise king and he ruled his people with justice and they, he kept them safe and protect his country and his people from all the enemies around. One day, a messenger, there was no WhatsApp, not messenger from the Facebook, a real man, messenger came to him with a message from the king from the neighboring kingdom. And he was really a very bad uh, um, king. And the message was, if you will not answer the question below in one month, I will come, I, the king was telling the king Arthur, and occupy your uh, country, destroy all your country, I, kill, I will kill all your people. And the question was, what woman really wants? And you have one month to answer. This was the condition. Okay. King Arthur, first he called for his uh, knights with the uh, knights of the round table. He asked them to go around all the kingdom and ask wise people, priests, uh, ordinary people, everyone, what is the answer? It's a really difficult, complicated question. What really woman wants. Week, the first, second, third week, the fourth week started and there was no answer. And King Arthur was really worried about his country, about his people, and he will not, he, he, will, he will can't really face this uh, king with all his soldiers, with all his power. He need really to answer this question. Everybody consult him to go to the witch. But everybody knows that this witch will really ask for a very high price for, his, for her advice. But he had no choice, only three days left. So he went over hills and rivers and valleys to the forest behind the sun. There was no sun entering this. Wood. 
and there was this witch. She was really ugly with one tooth, with horrible face, with very bad smell. He went to her and asked her for the answer for this question. What woman really wants? Uh, she told him, uh, okay, I will answer you. I will give you the answer because you have to save your country, but in one condition. Please tell me what. Say, I want to marry your most handsome, wise, great knight, Lancelot, your closer friend. Oh my God, but he had no choice. Okay, he promised her and she gave him the answer. And she told him, it's a secret. You will send him only to the king who will attack you, to stop him at, at, uh, from attacking you. Okay, he left her, went back to his palace. He wrote the answer, asked for the messenger. The messenger took the message to the king in the neighboring kingdom. And the kingdom of King Arthur was safe. He said it was, he was in the uh, Britain, in England, but it's not sure that he even exists, King Arthur, but it's so much stories about him. So, but he have to obey this witch. He called for, for his knight, for his knight, the most wonderful, handsome, wise, wise knight and his closer friend. And he told him about this condition. He said, okay, I really, I have no problem to marry this witch. And in the day of the wedding, everybody was sad. All the women who dreamed about this night were really very sad. And they were more sad when they saw this witch, ugly, horrible witch. And really they hardly dance, they hardly sing. And when the celebration was finished, the knight had to go with his wife to their room. They went there and a miracle happened. She became a beautiful young lady. It was unbelievable. He said, oh my God, you will be like this always? He said, no, I can be like this, or in the more in the day, during the day, or during the night. He said, "Okay, uh, during the day." She said, "Ah, so you really feel ashamed to be with me as an ugly witch? You want me to, to be beautiful during the day, and you, during the night you don't care and you will not be close to me?" He said, "No, okay, be beautiful during the night and be a witch during the day." Oh, you want all the people to feel mercy about you and I will feel bad. So, oh my God, so what I have to do? She told him the answer, what woman really wants. And it's to give, she told him, give me the freedom to be in charge of my own life. Give me to take the decision when to be beautiful and when to be witch. So he gave her the decision, but I don't know what she really chose. I told you the story and put it in your heart. I hope you will love it as I do. And I think all of us want the freedom, not only women, also men, also the young children, to decide for our own life as a people also, as a Palestinian. Thank you. Thank you so much for that story, Denise. I love your story so much. And that one was really great for the this week and this day of International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. um, we now turn uh, to our main issue of the week and our special guest. Uh, as Renza speaks, if you think of a question, please type it in the chat and we'll try to ask as many of them as possible at the end when we get to the Q&A. Danda, please take it away. Good evening to everyone and uh, happy International Women's Day to all uh, the women 
uh, with us today and also to all men supporters of uh, gender equality and women's human rights. Uh, I'm so glad to speak to you today and um, on the issue of women, peace and security, an issue which we uh, put, it, put it as at the forefront of our concerns uh, at my organization, the Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling. We shortly call it WICLAC. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the abbreviations of the name of the organization. Uh, I think this year is very unique. We are starting the 21st uh, year of, uh, of uh, Women, Peace and uh, I mean, uh, of the uh, uh, passage of the 1325 uh, uh, UN resolution, Security Council resolution on Women, Peace and Security. Uh, we are. Uh, we have postponed the Generation Equality Conference, uh, which will focus on women leadership and uh, gender-based violence uh, uh, in the context of the follow-up of the Beijing Plus 25 uh, Platform of Action. Uh, we, uh, in the Palestinian context, as you most probably know, uh, are uh, uh, preparing for uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, Legislative Council elections after over uh, 14, almost 15 years of uh, interruption of uh, democracy and the, uh, 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 the elections taking place with the internal political divide that has really disrupted the whole uh, process of, uh, of uh, democratic uh, processes that lead to uh, addressing issues of uh, participation. Palestinian women, during uh, 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 during uh, these days are really very uh, uh, hopeful that they can be in decision making uh, positions that uh, the, the situation changes in order to, that they be able to uh, to to be uh, how, more represented uh, in the upcoming palestinian legislative council uh, as the title says of this year 2021 the government called it or the palestinian authority called it as the year of democracy we're hoping it will be the year of democracy the year of uh, the passage of legislations uh, in the right uh, platforms especially in inside the uh, palestinian legislative council we're hoping that women's political participation becomes higher uh, although there are not uh, good signals because we wanted to have 30 percent uh, quota and uh, the presidential decree that was passed by the president uh, only allows in the candidates lists to be 26 percent and uh, this is not in the results the results might be less we're hoping it will be 26 but it all depends on where the women are rated in the inside the candidates lists of the different political parties or independent parties that will run the elections. So uh, the hopes were still, uh, we had higher expectations, but having said that, this is a very important opportunity to push forward and to encourage women to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, nominate themselves and um, uh, participate in the decision making in, in, in the upcoming elections. This is very much at the forefront. It is one of the important components of the uh, UN Security Resolution 1325 and its subsequent uh, resolutions. It has emphasized uh, the, the role of the women's political participation in conflict situations. And I can tell you that Palestinians are living under a prolonged military occupation and we are we definitely understand that we might not be able to uh, really uh, practice our rights uh, co uh, complete, co comprehensively and completely with continuing uh, Israeli occupation, but we will have some uh, um, space uh, to practice our uh, uh, democratic life if any, hopefully the, everything goes well and the elections uh, are conducted in order to really influence uh, policies, legislation, and ensure a better future for uh, the younger generations, uh, especially young girls and, and women. Of course, um, uh, the Palestinian, uh, uh, Palestinian people 
always uh, look at uh, the root problem of the continued Israeli occupation as the major problem which should be addressed in order for the Palestinian people to have the right to self-determination and the right to control their resources and be able to enjoy their rights and freedoms. And therefore, when we uh, initially uh, uh, engaged with the Women, Peace and Security agenda, uh, the, it was very important for us to highlight the Israeli uh, gendered impact of their violations on the lives of girls and women in our own society. We have been uh, planning from the very start. It was civil society organizations before uh, the um, official adoption of the Palestinian Authority of the uh, Women, Peace and Security Agenda who started the initiation of this uh, work. Although we were not happy with the initial uh, resolution 1325, which addressed conflicts in a vague way, not addressing uh, uh, occupation, especially a prolonged occupation, belligerent occupation like the one we're living under uh, since uh, 1967. Despite that, I think uh, we wanted to uh, engage with this uh, mechanism. And we know that it's one of the mechanisms. It's not going to bring in all the solutions, but it's one of the mechanisms. And we developed a, a, a network of Palestinian uh, uh, activists from civil society organizations under the umbrella of the Palestinian General Union. And we started, uh, we developed an action plan. And that action plan was later uh, adopted by the uh, government or by the Ministry of uh, uh, Women's Affairs when they indulged into uh, the adoption of, uh, I mean, voluntarily uh, agreeing on the 1325 uh, resolution and um, started to work on the development of the first action plan or the first generation action plan. The main components of the first generation action plan was prevention, the, the three P's that you most probably know, prevention, protection, and participation. Uh, but definitely we uh, added another component, which is uh, accountability. Palestinian women from the very beginning, civil society organizations, and then uh, uh, the government, when they adopted the 1325 resolution, understanding the situation under which Palestinians live, wanted to have the resolution combined with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Convention, uh, including the resolutions that are relevant, which is resolution number 30, international uh, as well as international human rights law and humanitarian law. We thought that this is a comprehensive package that should be addressed and not only look at the resolution in isolation of other uh, UN resolutions on one hand and other international instruments, including international human rights and humanitarian law. From the very beginning, we wanted to use 1325 as a tool to address the gendered impact of the occupation on the daily lives of Palestinian women. As you most probably know, in, in the Palestinian context, uh, Jerusalem is a, an annexed city illegally annexed by the occupation since 1967. The other parts of the occupied territory are still under Israeli military control. Despite the Oslo records, we think that uh, uh, we still, uh, this is not really uh, uh, distracting us from realizing that we're still under occupation. Even in Gaza Strip, because Israel still uh, controls the borders, controls the, keep the, Palestinian, uh, over a million and a, almost two million Palestinians under uh, unblocked since uh, 2007, you can understand the, uh, the, the implication on, on, on the lives of all Palestinian civilians, but specifically on the lives of Palestinian women and girls. Uh, through our evidence-based data, which we collect uh, and through monitoring and documenting Israeli violations from a gender lens, we realized that many of the, uh, of the uh, uh, violations are multi-layered. And, uh, and the, 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 this is because we live within a patriarchal society with uh, gender roles being divided on a very conventional or uh, you know, traditional way with women being uh, 
confined to the traditional roles of uh, unpaid care duties, as well as uh, the uh, 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 taking care of the children and um, the family, and all the most more, more vulnerable groups within the family. This has resulted in, in, the, in a situation where women have been uh, the main caregivers, as I mentioned, and have to bear uh, with the, the impact, the, the direct impact of many of the Israeli violations in a different way. Specifically, for example, the house demolitions, which really is the uh, domain of women being at home. They had to manage their, the lives of their families with all the constraints combined with collective punishments uh, of house demolitions, punitive uh, measures taken for house demolitions, or even uh, demolitions for other reasons, for lack of licenses which are not being given. The house demolition policy, the policy of uh, the Israeli, Israeli of uh, child home arrest of many of the children, night raids, and all other violations where putting the women in a situation where they had to do all their best to protect uh, members of the family, especially their children. Uh, we have seen women abandoning their jobs to stay, uh, to become themselves the prison guards of their own children at homes. And therefore, uh, because they didn't, uh, the children were released on bail and uh, they had to stay uh, uh, at home arrest. And um, many of the wives had even sometimes, uh, the mothers, I mean, had to uh, abandon the jobs because they wanted to ensure that the children do not leave the home. Many times they would move them to other members of the family, extended family to live with, and therefore the mothers had to uh, move from, away from their own homes uh, where the child is at home arrest in order to, uh, to ensure that the family does not pay the fi fines and so on. So many of the implications of the Israeli violations at the very beginning had different impact on women's lives rather than how it's impacting the lives of uh, men. In addition, this is uh, inter, uh, you know, the intersectional relationship or the, if this interwines with the very fact that many times Palestinian women endure gender-based violence within a patriarchal society because of the Israeli policies, which include, for example, uh, uh, per, the permit system, uh, entry into the, uh, Jerusalem if you are a, a West Bank uh, citizen and you want to get married to a Jerusalemite, you have to, uh, the husband has to apply for permits for women to enter into the uh, uh, East Jerusalem or to have a uh, permit at least or family unification and if the marriage does not work out then uh, the implications is the is that the women uh, have uh, to leave Jerusalem, for example, and that really means that they will have to abandon their children. They have to uh, uh, be under the control of the husband who uh, should apply for uh, family education and if, or for permits, and uh, they can lose many of their rights to health insurance, to uh, even in, in the courts, because there are uh, rivalry between the courts implement, uh, the, uh, rulings in the West Bank with those in the, in the, in the occupied territory compared with occupied annexed Jerusalem, many women uh, uh, lose the right to uh, uh, maintenance, uh, to, uh, to right to maintenance or custody of the children because uh, they look at the best interest of the child. And if she's not residing in Jerusalem, for example, and cannot reside after divorce, then they lose many of their rights. So this intersectional relationship between the occupation and patriarchal structures deeply enshrined in our society or in, entrenched in our society make the lives of Palestinian women even more complicated. Therefore, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda address the issues of the uh, Israeli occupation policies as they impact women. We address the issue of, uh, of uh, 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 how to prevent, uh, how to protect uh, women who are uh, mostly at home and they're affected by the settler violence which they are subjected to or to uh, uh, destruction of, of the agricultural land or the environment where women are responsible for the agricultural work and the crops around their households. And therefore many of the implications of the occupation and their agents, the settlers who are illegally residing in the occupied territory are impacted by 
uh, are more impacted by the, them and their children. Also the pollution and the dumping of solid uh, waste into the occupied territory, the limited water resources make the women really in a situation where they have to manage uh, uh, limited water resources, uh, provide the, uh, a solution to the uh, uh, lack of infrastructures, no, la uh, no sewage system, as well as all the uh, implications uh, uh, connected with, the, with the, the Israeli policies of controlling the natural resources of the occupied territory. So that was one of uh, our concerns to monitor and document to prevent and protect uh, those families that are being impacted and as well as a request for accountability. And it is timely now to speak about accountability. We are very glad, you know, only last Wednesday, the International Criminal Court uh, uh, attorney general or the public prosecutor of the International Criminal Court have announced that they will start investigations into the Israeli war crimes uh, that have been committed uh, during the years of occupation. That is a good sign that uh, we want also to ensure that, that uh, the culture of impunity does not continue. Uh, we think in, under the agenda of the Women, Peace and Security specifically that uh, it is very important uh, not to, uh, 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 I mean, um, uh, uh, it is important that we uh, address uh, uh, all political issues, all economic issues, all social issues that impact our lives. We think that women's voices uh, as peace builders, as, as initiators of act, uh, of, of uh, human security. We think that we are against, we negate, uh, uh, we, we don't want only to be in, 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 in politics. We want really to change lives of the people to the better. We want to ensure that uh, we live in human security, in peace, uh, and therefore our perspective of what we understand by the women peace and security agenda is definitely different than perhaps how the male politicians look at it. We think that every issue that addresses, uh, uh, that, that is being addressed is our issue. We should make the voices of women being heard in every issue that impacts the lives of the Palestinian women, either living under occupation or because of being under occupation or being in a, in the Palestinian society with the gender uh, uh, discriminatory uh, policies, legislations, lack of political will to address the um, uh, discriminatory uh, uh, laws that we have inherited from the previous uh, decades on, the, on uh, Palestine uh, during Jordan or, um, or uh, the Egyptian rule over Gaza. We really want uh, to address everything. And that's why we think that it is the time when we have to make our perspective and our voices being heard on all aspects. And therefore, without being engaged, we will not be able to do that. It is very important to mention that all of this has been further exacerbated during COVID-19. Last year was a very difficult year. We're still living under COVID-19. The impact of COVID-19 on all Palestinians has been difficult because Israel has not undertaken their legal obligations as an occupying authority under international humanitarian law and human rights law to provide medical care. It was only after many calls that uh, even the Palestinians in East Jerusalem uh, or under the control of the Israelis, I mean, uh, occupation in Jerusalem have been able to get the necessary medical care, even testing for COVID-19 and not the vaccination. But still we see now a huge problem uh, uh, entailed with, uh, uh, entailed with the, the lack of vaccination and Israel denial of its legal obligation under international law to vaccinate the Palestinian uh, people in the occupied territory. Now, the impact of Palestinian women was uh, multi-layered. First of all, because they are the caregivers, they were relegated back to their traditional roles within the household. They have been, uh, they lost their jobs because they work in the informal sector. They started to face economic hardships because of COVID-19. And Jerusalemites or West Bank women married to Jerusalemites 
were uh, caught between the Israel and the OPT. They were not able to leave their homes because they were not re uh, renewing the permits to stay, permanent uh, permits to stay in. They overstayed their uh, permits in Jerusalem and they couldn't uh, come, uh, leave Jerusalem because they, uh, to, to, to join their families because uh, or get medical care in the West Bank. And that has created a lot of problems to women who, whose health issues have been impacted negatively because of the COVID-19. Also not to mention women from the Gaza Strip with chronic diseases that were facing problems with Israel closing the Gaza Strip with a blockade and additional COVID-19 preventing many of the women who might have been also abandoned by their husbands because they have chronic diseases like cancer, liver failure, and all of that from leaving the Gaza Strip. So we're talking about a situation that impacts everybody. But to us Palestinian women, it impacts us in a different way, completely different than that which, uh, which uh, affects uh, men in our own society. Having said all of that, we still uh, think that Palestinian women have the courage to engage, engage in every um, work uh, uh, to move forward the women peace and security agenda. As Palestinian women activists, we, 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 we joined also the higher national committee which was formulated by the cabinet, the Palestinian cabinet, and the uh, Minister of Women's Affairs. We sit on that, you know, we're, uh, uh, we've been uh, uh, appointed on, on this higher committee, and we have been engaging to, to, to bring in women more in political life because we still underscore in the political life of the Palestinian people. We have been uh, not misrepresented in all the, in the ministries, there has been a decrease in the number of ministers, women ministers. Now we have only 13 percent, uh, only three uh, women ministers. We don't have, uh, we are not uh, represented in uh, 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 higher decision making positions uh, uh, compared with the level of education we have, the level of, uh, of, uh, of expertise that we have. We are misrepresented at all levels and during COVID-19 we were further uh, misrepresented because we have not been in strategic committees to respond to the uh, needs of the Palestinian society. Uh, it was only voluntarily or the NGOs that have uh, uh, developed humanitarian activities or tried to engage but generally speaking uh, there was really uh, no uh, uh, poli policies that encouraged women to join uh, join uh, in strategic committees or that are strategic in decision making. Uh, some of the women uh, after the uh, local authorities, uh, the minister of local authorities, uh, uh, made a decision that they wanted to form neighborhood committees, were encouraged uh, to join them, but it did not exceed 16% at the best situation. So we are still underrepresented in many decision making positions, and therefore we are not uh, impacting politics in the real sense of the word. And while we're looking forward for the upcoming elections, we're hopeful that we, more women win the elections and started our campaigning with the political parties to list women at the top uh, lists of their candidates list. But having said all of that, we still suffer from gender inequality and discrimination in Palestinian current legislation, lack of political will for the adoption of uh, family protection bill a new uh, uh, developed uh, 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 personal status laws that are based on gender equality. And therefore, we have a long battle, a long way to go still before we achieve uh, uh, actual results. But we still believe that uh, we want to engage with the uh, women, peace and security agenda. We have our programs independent from the government, but also we uh, encouraged, uh, we, we contributed to the development of the second generation uh, um, uh, Women, Peace and Security Action Plan, National Action Plan, which is on the same different uh, components that I addressed earlier, accountability, participation, uh, protection and prevention, uh, but also 
we try to influence the Palestinian Authority to engage at the international level to advocate for uh, our rights as Palestinian uh, people and as Palestinian women. And we think that we can, we can adhere change, we can influence change if we uh, are a, a strong force that strongly believes that women can bring in a change in the Palestinian society. The way I tell you, the, the way is so long, but we think that it's in our best interest to see political reconciliation at the internal level. We don't want this political divide to continue anymore because as mothers, we know, I do recall a story of one of the women. Uh, I'm not very good like Denise in saying, in, in telling stories, but I do remember when the political divide happened uh, in the Gaza Strip and uh, the brothers were fighting uh, against each other because of being Hamas or being Fatah. Uh, one of the mothers, which we documented her ca case, was moving between two rooms and she was like uh, distracted. Uh, she represents the sufferings of Palestinian mothers. She said that, what do you want me to say? One of my children is wounded in this room. One of my sons is wounded in this room and he is Hamas and the other one is in the other room, he is Fatah. So the, the brothers were fighting with each other. And she said, in, in, in my interest, where shall I divide my heart? My heart is with my children. I want to see reconciliation, peacemaking, peace building. And I think women understand that because they are the main caregivers. They know when the, the family members are wounded or injured, when the husbands are imprisoned, they themselves are imprisoned, but also they suffer more from the becoming responsible for their families because of the Israeli occupation and uh, arresting their children or arresting their husbands or their uh, members of the family. They take the responsibilities to take care of the sick and the wounded. They understand the needs of their own community because they, they care at the hospitals. And this is what was happening during COVID-19 as well. So that's why we think that uh, uh, there is a pattern of excluding us, excluding us from decision-making um, positions, although we understand the priorities and the needs of our societies much better, we understand the needs of our families much better, and we think that we will continue to strive and, and struggle until we take our ac accurate place and the right place that we deserve in political uh, leadership and in uh, decision-making uh, positions in our own society in order to have a better future, a more, uh, um, uh, uh, a, a more safe uh, and secure uh, future to our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much for listening and I hope I was not very long with my presentation. Thank you so much, Renda. Thank you for sharing all of that what, valuable information and that final story that I think brought a little bit of tears to, to my eyes. Um, I think it really speaks to the role and, and the, the double kind of oppression that women are facing um, under occupation. And so really, uh, we really appreciate your stories and, and your, your, all of your knowledge and, and all the work that you do. I'm going to move over to some questions that we've been getting um from from attendees if you have any additional questions um the chat box is still open so please feel free to share um type your questions in there and we will try to get to all of the questions um in the time that we have so somebody asked about i just want to say hello to the people that i know i know some of the people in this uh, gathering and uh, i say hello to each one of you and especially i see in front of me kathy Berkan, uh, who's a... Oh, no. uh, many of you, uh, I, I think I met in some way or other, but until somebody asks or uh, wants to make an intervention or whatever. Thank you, Renda. We thought we lost you there for a second, but it, the- Yes, the, I did, yeah, back. I'm back. Um, great, yeah, so uh, the first question that I've got here is, um, about the impact of COVID-19. I know you touched on it actually after this question came in. So um, I'm just gonna, in case there's anything else around specifically the role that women have been able to play in politics and whether COVID-19 has had an impact on their political organizing um, 
uh, during this time? Um, actually, actually, COVID-19 had uh, ex extremely negative impact because uh, before that, before COVID-19, we had our own issues and our own challenges as Palestinian women who are being excluded. We do most of the work uh, and, and we know that we are uh, not represented. You know, for example, I, I, I remember uh, now immediately it comes to my mind that um, it's always being, uh, being, it's being said that uh, if you ask your mother, uh, what do you do? She tells you, I, I, say, I stay at home. It reminds me of this Indian student who asked his father about the work of his mother and he told him uh, that uh, uh, she doesn't work. And then the child made this very famous picture. Now, I don't know if you saw it on social media, which became the, the, the cover page of the Indian uh, report uh, on development this year, which uh, showed his mother doing 100 jobs that are not being uh, uh, recognized. And it is exactly what happens with our situation. We do a lot of work. We are responsible for the household, for the family. During COVID-19, we had been, we have been even further engaged in uh, online teaching, uh, coping with our own jobs at the same time, taking care of our children to study at home. We had uh, the the problems of protecting members of the family, securing the food, securing the needs of the family. At the same time. Uh, many of the women who works outside the house had to cope also with the challenges of working with all the children and the responsibilities that are not being shared within the household. But in, in making politics, uh, even further, I mean, uh, even economic hardships emerged because during COVID-19, the disruption of the courts, we noticed, for example, at Wicklack, that most of the cases that we received on helplines and uh, for for uh, 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 for uh, consultations or for need of assistance uh, showed that um, uh, uh, the economic hardships were, hardships were the most difficult ones. The the interruption of the court system and the uh, justice sector meant that many women were on hold. They, they were applying for maintenance of their children, for uh, um, uh, um, uh, divorce or for ensuring economic rights, mostly economic rights that have been uh, 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 disrupted, combined with the Palestinian government taking a decision that nobody will be imprisoned, which is good, yeah, but if they do not pay their debts, but many of the men who have court rulings to pay for the, for the maintenance of their children, for example, or their wives, stop to do it. And therefore, nobody would, the law will not take its um, uh, uh, place. So we do a lot of work, but uh, we are excluded in decision making. We are so overwhelmed with caregiving, un free caregiving, to the extent that um, to members of the family, to disabled, to people, the elderly, and everybody. And then, uh, when it comes to uh, to meeting our needs, even reproductive health rights, women's right to take uh, preg while pregnant, uh, all of them have been interrupted, and uh, many of the women have given birth without uh, any checkup during uh, all the year because of the interruptions of the uh, of the uh, COVID nineteen. They were neglecting their own health for the sake of the family. Having said all of that. It is always the responsibility of the official duty bearers to engage women in decision making and to see the important role. It's not only rhetorics that they raise or, or slogans that they make. They have to speak their, uh, their uh, what they call it, uh, walk the talk or, I mean, it's, it's too much lip service rather than really uh, developing policies, encouraging women to, uh, to engage in response plans, or, uh, or, or get engaged in decision-making uh, neighborhood committees, or even taking measures to really ensure that women take role in uh, political decision-making. Now for the preparations of the elections, for example, only four women joined the, the huge delegation that met in Cairo to discuss the uh, uh, preparations necessary for the upcoming uh, Palestinian elections. We are going to face a problem with the political parties, whether they are going to list the women at the top 
populists or not. It's a very huge thing uh, that requires also elections within the political parties uh, and not uh, setting, I mean, putting quotas to ensure that there is uh, a number of women and on, in order to encourage affirmative action and encourage women. And uh, all of that is an obstacle. Even the women are have less resources. If you want to uh, register as a candidate, you have to pay 3,000 dinars or something around $5,000 which women cannot really afford. Many of the women who work in uh, government or have a job or, or are in NGOs like me, I have to resign from my job if I want to uh, uh, run the elections, which means that I might not win the elections and lose my job. So there are many factors that are discouraging women, especially that uh, the society and the tradition uh, uh, is that uh, uh, politics is for men and not for women. And you have to change the, the mindset of the people before you uh, uh, can really uh, see or uh, sense some kind of change. Many of the, of the uh, candidates would elect if there are two members of the family, and it happened in previous elections, there is a woman and a man, they would support the man because we are a tribalistic society and we are extended families with tribal uh, uh, affiliations that uh, sets forth the elderly or the uh, those who are in, uh, older in age and are uh, more uh, have more resources and are rich and uh, also they have uh, 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 i mean uh, uh, Definitely, it's not uh, the criteria of uh, women and young uh, people, whether men or uh, women. And uh, the legislation are not encouraging younger generation to uh, to run elections. So we all of these are uh, obstacles that we have to overcome and we have to work on them. And there was a huge petition that was distributed two days ago where we were asking a, a presidential decree by order to decrease the age of um, uh, candidates and to uh, uh, increase uh, the uh, quota for women in the upcoming elections. We want at least 30% in results, not 26% in candidates list, because this is simple representation. Uh, uh, the, the system will be, all the country will be one political, uh, one government, one um, uh, uh, election in daira uh, intikhabiyya wahida. Yani it will, uh, there will be the system of simple majority. And therefore, the smaller uh, lists of candidates who are not uh, politically affiliated with the major political parties uh, might not win a lot of uh, seats in the upcoming elections. And therefore, the, uh, the, the, the uh, seats will be distributed among uh, uh, the political parties. We're hoping that being one government all over the country will, in, uh, one, it's not like previous elections, it's a mixed system where there is only, uh, there are the different governance where you elect some, some people and then there's one list, half, half. And now this time it's all one government, which gives opportunities, better opportunities for women uh, and younger people to win the elections, but it also creates a possibility that many women will, uh, that many uh, uh, candidates will lose because they cannot bring in the simple majority for the upcoming elections. Thank you, Renda. Um, just as a, a quick follow-up to that, someone asked, do men also have to quit their jobs to run for elections? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, everybody, everybody, whether it's uh, in public office or in NGOs or in the private sector. If you want to run the elections, you have to uh, drop, uh, resign from your posts, which really entails that many would not make this uh, sacrifice without ensuring the results. And, and mostly they will lose their, uh, their jobs and therefore they would rather uh, opt for not uh, running the election. So we're encouraging women to defy that and to encourage them to run the elections. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying and thank you for sharing all of that. Um, somebody also asked, how is the registration for voting carried out? 
It was done uh, online with the exception of Jerusalem, uh, which will be depending, we're still not sure, uncertain how the elections will take place in Jerusalem. Most probably will be in the surrounding uh, neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. Uh, the others, uh, the registration has already stopped everybody. There's around 85% of the, those who are uh, eligible for elections that have already registered uh, for the upcoming elections. And uh, the Jerusalemites will register from the uh, uh, election uh, circle where they will conduct their elections on the day of the elections, which is the 22nd of May. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, maybe, maybe, maybe the Palestinian uh, government now with a, a new NGO law amendments on the NGO law uh, are trying to create a lot of trouble and uh, uh, environment which is uh, really in, uh, incur uh, intruding, not intruding even encroaching over the civil society sector. And uh, today we heard the prime minister saying that they will freeze the amendments on the NGO law. But uh, until we see that happening, I think that uh, there might be many reasons or excuses, I would say, for not conducting the elections. Let's hope that the elections will take place because um, if the COVID-19 spread of the third wave, which is very, very widespread in the occupied territory, continues this way, combined with the uh, with the, some of the uh, government's policies and presidential decrees that are really challenging the rights and freedoms of the people in the OPT or in the Palestinian territory, that will create an environment which is not suitable for conducting elections. By the way, the president issued a, a decree in uh, uh, releasing uh, uh, rights and freedoms, but at the same time, only a few days later, he uh, constrained the work of uh, civil society organizations, and we had to campaign against that. It's distracting us from elections to other uh, issues which should not take our time and effort at all, especially during a time when we are uh, uh, preparing ourselves for elections. Absolutely, thank you. And and Nadia, could you just clarify what the NGO law is? I think it would be good to just yeah. You know, actually, the NGO law is very important to mention that it was one of the basic laws that were adopted by the Palestinian Legislative Council in 2000. It is one of the most progressive uh, laws which allows civil society organizations to work independently from the government. It, it stipulates that the that uh, NGOs can register with the um, with the specialized uh, ministry. For example, in our situation, WICLAC, because we do social legal aid to women victims of gender-based violence, the government that uh, the the uh, uh, um, the the ministry that follows us is the Ministry of Social Development and the Ministry of Interior. The Ministry of Interior uh, it makes the registrations. They do not interfere with the registrations, everybody would sub up, apply. And within a period of time, if uh, everything is fine, uh, we should get the uh, registration okay without interference of the uh, ministries or the Palestinian Authority. Now, uh, uh, the presidential decree, all of a sudden, uh, on uh, the 28th of, it's not on the all of a sudden, there was an attempt two years ago, but it was not implemented because we fought against it. Uh, uh, what we know that it was recommended uh, on the 11th of January by the cabinet, the Palestinian cabinet, uh, uh, some amendments on the Palestinian NGO law. And these amendments uh, were presented, uh, recommended for the president who issued on the 28th of uh, uh, February, uh, a presidential decree that has the power of law, amending around four or five provisions of the Palestinian NGO law. And these really make, in, in brief, the amendments will make us uh, as a department within the specialized uh, 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 ministry. For example, uh, um, uh, we have to, uh, the new law stipulates that we have to present to the, uh, to the ministry that is following us, which is, uh, for example, the social development or the Ministry of Health or depending, education or the, the ministry concerned, uh, a, a, an annual plan 
uh, and this annual plan should be in compliance with the government's plan. So this IE means that we cannot do anything beyond what the government does. In me, it means that no advocacy work, no uh, watchdog role, no uh, oversight over the performance of the executive authority. We have to have a plan to be approved by the ministry concerned. That's one thing. Second thing, we have to develop budgets that do not exceed 25% for salaries and running costs. Can you imagine? We are labor intensive organizations, heavily dependent on our lawyers, social workers, uh, for example, WICLAC. I'm speaking about WICLAC. And our programs really uh, heavily depend on, on the work of our employees. Uh, we provide legal aid, services, uh, protection for women victims of gender-based violence, all of that uh, uh, based on, uh, based on uh, 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 the work of our staff. And when you say that you only want 25%, it means that most of us will close because we, we, we maybe spend 70% on salaries, another 10 or 12% on uh, running costs, you're telling us close, and you are asking the smaller NGOs to submit audited statements if they work above 1,000, uh, around $1,500. And imagine if you want to have a, a report, an audited report submitted to the specialized ministry, that is following your work, you have to pay 5,000 at least, $4,000 for, for an audited statement, uh, four or five times more. This means that many of the NGOs will dissolve themselves. Now, when it comes to dissolving themselves, they change the law. Before, the law says that if we want to dissolve ourselves, our board of directors and our general assembly decide uh, based on their bylaws where to, to uh, transfer the funds. Maybe give them, for example, in our situation at Wicklock, it's stipulated in our bylaws that if we dissolve ourselves, the funds that we have and the uh, 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 either funds or uh, equipment or whatever goes to a similar organization like us, another feminist human rights organization. Uh, now they said that the uh, government will uh, uh, will uh, nominate a person uh, to do this dissolving of the NGO. The money goes to the public treasury and it's done by the Minister of Interior. And you can see this really means that we uh, they are trying to target uh, the, the freedom of the vibrant Palestinian civil society and charitable organizations who have given charitable organizations, NGOs and all of that, that are registered and who have been giving social, legal, educational, cultural, humanitarian aid uh, to the most vulnerable groups in our society and have been really covering up on the shortage that the Palestinian Authority is doing. So there has been really a, a real encroachment and uh, uh, I would say paraly paralyzing the whole work of civil society who has been in existence prior to the advent of the Palestinian Authority and, and have been able to complement in many ways the services provided by the official institutions. Having said all of that, we had to stand against it. Today, the president said, I will freeze the law to negotiate with NGOs. You will freeze the law to change some of the provisions. To us as Palestinian NGOs and civil society, we don't want them to touch, touch it at all because it's not priority. It's not a necessity to change it. It's on the contrary. We are one of the best uh, laws that it's one of the best laws that have been developed by the first Palestinian Legislative Council in 2000. You want to uh, uh, try to control the NGOs to channel the funds through the government and this is really will make us lose our independence and the role that the boards of our organizations and general assemblies of our organizations uh, play right now and we become puppets in the hands of the government to use our funds in our name for their own plans and for their own benefit.
Thank you, Nanda. That was really helpful. Um, there are some questions in the chat box about whether this could be possibly due to uh, pressure from Israel, the amendment, or, or you know, thoughts of why. No, but it's an additional pressure on us uh, that we have to endure the pressure imposed on uh, uh, many NGOs and civil society organizations that have been uh, monitoring, documenting, and using international mechanisms to advocacy and engaging with UN mechanisms for protection of Palestinian civilians, including the ICC and the decision that we took only lately. Uh, there has been a lot of campaigns from NGO Monitor, from Zionist Israeli organizations, Zionist organizations, namely, all over Europe, uh, uh, supported by the strategic uh, ministry, Israeli ministry, uh, that has been established in order to uh, defame Palestinian civil society organizations. So we have been caught between this uh, uh, Israeli policies of uh, constraining uh, the work of uh, NGOs, especially human rights organizations on one hand, or even uh, humanitarian organizations. And uh, on the other hand, we have to face uh, 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 this new change that the government is thinking that by this way, they could channel many of the funds that reach to us to the uh, uh, government's challenge, a, a, a treasury and the public treasury of the government. And it will become an, an additional income for the government who is uh, heavy, you know, I mean, the reasons might be different. They don't want us to become the watchdogs. They want us only to do the service work and provide the uh, humanitarian aid to cover up on their programs. And uh, they don't want us to be, to have any oversight over them. They want to shut the voices uh, to silence the voices of civil society organizations who are critical of their policies, who are uh, uh, highlighting the gaps and shortages in the performance of the government. And God knows, uh, and they don't want us also to monitor the upcoming elections, which is our priority now, because we want to have uh, clean elections where everybody gets it in a democratic way without monopolism or without uh, cheating in the upcoming elections. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Nando. This has been really um, eye-opening. I think a lot of us are aware of the situation behind the elections and we're really aware of, you know, what's going on with the ICC case, but it's, it's really, you know, my, like uh, shocking the way that things are connecting with the, the PA's actions at the moment uh, on the ground. I want to yeah. shift gears for a bit because there's just a few questions around, you know, uh, the what's happening on the ground for women, and I want to touch on those before we wrap up. So there's a question around whether families are still being separated because West Bank Palestinian workers are having to stay in Israel due to Israel's COVID movement restrictions. Are you? Uh, yeah. I I think that that was at the beginning of the lockdown where uh, many of the uh, movement between of uh, workers inside Israel were restricted. And now because we are, some governments are on lockdown like uh, Ramallah, Bethlehem uh, and uh, uh, Nablus, uh, movement from and out of uh, uh, these governments are completely closed. But uh, the, the comprehensive closure for all workers inside Israel is not still uh, on. Uh, it was for a period of time, and it was really very uh, shameful how we started to uh, uh, stereotype and even create uh, even the discourse of the government, the spokesperson of the government at the beginning of the closure was uh, was uh, was saying that we're getting COVID-19 from Israel, from the workers inside Israel and the families and, and then imposing on the wives of these uh, uh, workers to uh, to restrict the movement of their husbands, you know, and not understanding the balance of power in the family. And they're putting the responsibility of women to, to, to ensure that their husbands do not go and sit in public places when they come from Israel and, and so on. The restrictions are now depending on the government that there is a peak in the cases of uh, uh, contraction of COVID-19 rather than the comprehensive closure that we had at the beginning of uh, COVID-19 closures and shutdowns. Now it is more depending on the government. I'm sure now, for example, Ramallah government 
uh, Nablus government and Bethlehem government are completely shut and workers do not uh, commute to Israel uh, for their daily work inside Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Randa. And um, one last question is, are the Israeli checkpoints especially difficult for Palestinian women? Excuse me, I didn't get, uh, what are they? Are they especially difficult for pal for Palestinian women? So I think some they're of difficult are difficult for everybody. They're yeah. difficult for everybody, uh, and uh, there are uh, specificities for women. And as I mentioned to you, uh, if uh, now the, the the Israelis Minister of Interior is not giving uh, permanent mer permits. So many of the women who are depending on the annual permit or the six month permit that the husband applies for are now interrupted because they are not giving these uh, permits. And therefore women are not able to leave Jerusalem because they overstate their permits. And if they leave, they cannot, uh, they are not giving permits anymore. They cannot uh, renew their permits and therefore they will be separated from their families. So they are uh, not commuting and they are not uh, uh, because they have to show their identifications entering into uh, 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 Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and therefore it is very difficult for them uh, to leave their homes. They are not being able to see the members of their family, their parents, their uh, other members of the family, and uh, they opt to stay with their families inside Jerusalem uh, because they overdue their permits. Family unification applications are uh, frozen at the time being, and therefore uh, uh, this combined with the revocation of residency rights, which, which is very common policy for the Israelis, this is really exacerbating the sufferings of women compared with other members of the family, uh, but uh, also the Gaza women. I told you, and many of them have been abandoned because they have cancer or uh, very uh, serious uh, diseases by their husbands. I mean, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, and they got re uh, remarried to other wives and so on. This is combined with Israeli restrictions of leaving and coming uh, for a referral of cases for medical care to Jerusalem to the West Bank or abroad. And therefore, women are really uh, uh, suffering the most. It's not that they are the only ones uh, suffering, but they are suffering the most because this is uh, combined with patriarchal structures and uh, cultural constraints, social constraints on women who are being stereotyped because they have diseases and they have problems. So it's, the checkpoint system is affecting everybody, but the checkpoint system has different impact if we look at it from a gender lens. Absolutely, thank you so much, Randa. And thank you all for your questions um, and Randa for all of your responses. They really appreciate it. I know I learned a lot um, just from, from hearing you speak. And so it's, it's been really great to be here with you today. I apologize that we don't have time to answer every question I'd like to briefly point you to our Kumi entry and action for the week and, and links are going to be shared to that in the chat. Um, we, so the Kumi action for the week um, is that we have written short profiles for seven strong Palestinian women and we are sharing them with you via the newsletter and on the website. Take these profiles and post them one per day on social media or print them out and post them someplace others can see them. Include a link to this page of the Kumi Now website, along with the hashtags IWD2021, hashtag choose to challenge, hashtag Palestinian women, hashtag Kumi Now, and hashtag Kumi 10. Um, Renda, I don't know if you have any, uh, I want to give you a chance to quickly chime in if you have thoughts on the Kumi Now action or other ways that people watching can help pr uh, promote women playing an equal role in peace building. Um, well, I, uh... Uh, there's a lot of things that could be done, but uh, at least making the voices of women being heard. Uh, there are, I mean, it's very nice to feature seven uh, important women. I saw whom you have chosen uh, for your, uh, for uh, this uh, uh, theme, this, uh, this time. I mean, I think uh, uh, Palestinian women are very strong and they really need their voices to be heard. And it's true that we, we chose the challenge and we will 
go through th this challenge. And uh, we are, uh, while we are uh, very realistic that our situation is difficult uh, under the current situation, we still believe that we can be uh, agents of change and therefore make our voices more heard. Uh, 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 encourage uh, uh, women to, uh, I mean, speak to your uh, uh, MPs uh, about uh, 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 this, uh, open for us uh, platforms where we can speak to uh, other uh, influential people, MPs and so on in your own uh, societies in order to uh, make the, uh, to amplify the voices of women in our society. Uh, Palestinian women are brave, they're strong, and they can uh, really be agents of change, they have to be given the opportunity to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, a link to this video, the video of this gathering will be posted along with the links shared today on the Kumi Now website and on YouTube in a day or so, and it will be shared in the next newsletter. You can subscribe to Kumi Now on YouTube and subscribe to our newsletter and make sure you receive them. We would greatly appreciate if you've shared this amazing session with your friends and colleagues, as well as information on our future sessions. And we're looking forward to get it. I'm looking forward to get it as well. Yes, me too. And I'm looking forward to share it, sharing it with a lot of women that I know that are doing this, you know, women advocacy work. Um, I think they would really appreciate the Palestinian perspective and the Palestinian lens. So thank you. Thank so you very much, much Yara, uh, Yara, for uh, facilitating this session. And thank you, Kumi Sabil and the uh, uh, Kumi Now group for inviting me. I, I had the honor of being with you today. I hope I, uh, I, I was, uh, we say in Arabic, uh, light on you and uh, um, uh, you enjoyed listening and learning from this uh, experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. I Thank really appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. We absolutely really did. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful experience. I do just want to quickly share that next week we will be learning about the olive trees in Palestinian culture and the economy and how Israeli settlers are waging war by destroying these ancient trees. Um, our guest will be Raed Abu uh, Salye, a Catholic priest in the village of Taibe and founder of the Olive Branch Foundation. So if you'd like to be reminded of the online gatherings an hour before they begin, you can register for email reminders at kuminow.com slash online using the form at the bottom of the page. We all hope to see you back next week. And thank you so much again, Venda, and to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, -bye. Good night.